Hello, I'm Amy Sussman from the National Center for Special Education Research, NIS. I am the program officer for this competition, research networks focused on critical problems of policy and practice in special education. I'm also the program officer for Nixer's early intervention portfolio. Here's an outline of what I will cover today. First, I'll provide an overview of the network's competition and the specific topic, multi-level systems of support. Next, I will discuss the roles and responsibilities of network members, followed by the specific requirements and recommendations for each role, research teams, and network lead. We'll cover some requirements for the application itself, such as the appendices, and end with advice for preparing a responsive and competitive application. In part one, I'll provide an overview of the network's competition and the topic in particular. The network objectives include focusing resources and attention on special education issues that are a high priority for the nation, creating a structure and process for researchers to share ideas, build new knowledge, and strengthen their research and dissemination capacity, and advancing the field's understanding of a problem or issue beyond what one research team can do on its own. There is only one network topic in fiscal year 2017, Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, or MTSS. This competition focuses on integrated MTSS, which is a comprehensive framework that provides multiple levels of support through coordinated research-based practices, strategies, and structures to meet the academic as well as the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all learners. There's been less research on integrating both academic and behavioral tiered systems, yet there may be some benefits to an integrated system. For example, this may create a more seamless system in which they are aligned and do not counteract one another. In addition, they may better serve students with disabilities who struggle in both academic and behavior skills. MTSS generally involves multiple tiers, frequently three tiers, of increasingly intensive intervention. It should include universal screening, progress monitoring, and database decision making. IES is seeking proposals that focus on MTSS in elementary schools as authentic education settings. There are several reasons for focusing on elementary schools. The focus on one school level or similar grades will help promote commonality among the different research projects and will facilitate meaningful collaboration among research teams. We hope that a more coherent set of findings will provide more clear implications for next steps in research practice and policy. Elementary schools are generally kindergarten through grade five. However, the grades can be extended if they meet the following conditions. Preschool or pre-K students and settings may be included if they are part of a K through 12 school system. And kindergarten through grade eight schools may be included if students in all grades are under the same system and would be served under the same MTSS framework. The research in your project must address the needs of and include outcomes for students with or at risk for disabilities. By its very nature, MTSS serves all students. For example, Tier 1 includes universal practices for all students. At higher tiers, the framework serves children at risk for disabilities and with disabilities. Your proposed research must include students with or at risk for disabilities, but may also include other typically developing students, or all students served by the system. Although MTSS takes a systems approach, student outcomes must be measured. Preschool outcomes include developmental outcomes, including cognitive, communicative, linguistic, social, emotional, adaptive, functional, or physical development. They also include school readiness outcomes, including pre-reading, language, vocabulary, early math or science knowledge, and social and behavioral competencies that prepare children for school. In kindergarten through the end of elementary school, student outcomes include learning, achievement, and higher order thinking in core academic content areas, such as reading, writing, mathematics, and science. Social skills and behavior is important to education and post-success, and functional outcomes that improve education results. This is just a visual overview of the structure of the network this competition intends to fund. There will be multiple research teams working on their research, but the teams will share information and collaborate. For example, sharing research plans, measures, etc. The network lead is a team that holds the network together by coordinating network-wide activities. The next slide will explain this further. There must be a minimum of two research teams funded in order to form a network. 
the maximum number of research teams funded will be four. There also must be one network lead funded to form the network. As we'll cover shortly, the network lead is the team that administers and coordinates network activities, organizes cross-team training of early career researchers, and facilitates the communication of research findings. Now we've reached part two of the webinar, roles, responsibilities, and requirements of the network members. The primary goal of the network's competition is to create a structure and process for research collaborations on integrated elementary school multi-tiered systems of support to advance the field beyond what one research team could do on its own. Therefore, a primary expectation of the network is to share information and materials. This includes research plans, data collection tools if relevant, and other ideas. The teams are also expected to provide one another with constructive feedback on their ideas and research plans. They're also expected to look for opportunities to strengthen their collective work, which includes opportunities to provide leadership to the field and to provide cross-site training or mentoring of early career researchers who are working on these research projects. Finally, teams must collaborate on dissemination activities, including a synthesis of the network's research findings, joint publications, and policy briefings. Much of this collaborative dissemination and other collective work will be coordinated through the team lead, as explained in more detail later. For example, they will take the lead on the synthesis, coordinate full network meetings, develop a website, and organize meeting with policymakers. Now we're going to discuss research team applications. Research teams must address, at a minimum, the key components of multi-tiered systems of support and outcomes of students with or at risk for disabilities. IES is open to a range of different types of disabilities or severity of disabilities. Applicants are encouraged to address other challenges or issues beyond the minimum. The Request for Applications, or RFA, lists additional issues in need of further research, but while these issues are encouraged, they will not receive preferential treatment. In other words, there are no extra points or increases on your score if you focus on one of those listed areas. There are four primary sections of the application narrative for research teams. These include significance, research plan, personnel, and resources. Note that the recommended length of the narrative for a research team proposal is 30 pages. In the RFA, each of these sections has a list of requirements. And note that you, if you don't address these requirements, your application will not be considered. They also include a list of recommendations to make your application more competitive. The significant section is where you will discuss what issues your research will address and why these are important. You are required to indicate the specific research objectives and the student population or populations. For a competitive proposal, IES recommends that you discuss the state of integrated MTSS research. For example, indicate what is known and not known about how to implement MTSS in elementary schools discuss the major research questions and how they will address objectives of the MTSS network. Provide a theory of change or logic model relevant to your research goals. Describe the setting where you will conduct your research. Explain the overall vision for your research as well as the empirical and theoretical support for it. And discuss the practical importance of the research. The research plan section is where you will describe the methodology used to answer your research questions. You are required to describe your planned research methods and planned data analyses. There are more recommendations for this section described in the RFA than we could include in the slides, so I encourage you to read that part of the RFA very carefully. For competitive proposal, IES recommends that you discuss your sample and setting, for example, the sample size and populations, barriers to recruitment and retention, and how you plan to overcome those barriers, an authentic education setting, and why it's relevant to your research questions. A competitive proposal should also include measures, such as key variables, whether you will be developing measures or using pre-existing ones, and if using pre-existing ones, you want to include their psychometric properties. To continue recommendations for the research plan, you should include your specific approach to methodology and data analysis used to answer the research questions. If you're using extant data for any part of the study, you will want to discuss which measures or variables from that data set you plan to use. Finally, you should include a timeline to indicate your plans for each step in the project. For example, when does sample 
recruitment occur, when is data collection, etc. Note that you can place the timeline in the narrative or in Appendix C, but you cannot discuss it narratively in the appendix. For the personnel section, you are required to discuss the qualifications of members of the research team. For competitive proposal, IES recommends that you discuss key personnel at your primary institution and any subaward institutions and consultants, discuss the qualifications, roles, responsibilities, and percentage of time for the project. All key personnel should have sufficient percentages of committed time to carry out the proposed work, and include past success at dissemination. Describe the experience and expertise among team personnel in building partnerships with schools and communities who serve students with or at risk for disabilities and their history of translating research to practice for these schools and communities. Identify a point of contact for the research synthesis and discuss their qualifications and time commitment. Describe key personnel's past experiences working in a research network. Discuss the roles of key state or local officials if relevant. If they are participating, make sure to include letters of agreement in Appendix E. We'll discuss the appendices in more detail later. You should identify the management structure and procedures that will be used to keep your project on track and ensure the quality of its work. This is especially important for projects involving multiple institutions carrying out different tasks that must be coordinated and or integrated. For the resources section, you are required to discuss the resources you have to conduct the project. For competitive application, IES recommends that you discuss the institution's capacity and experience to manage a grant this size, discuss access to available resources at your institution and any subaward institutions, describe plans to acquire resources that are not currently available or accessible, discuss access to the schools and districts that will be the focus of your research, and you should include letters of agreement in Appendix E. Include information about student, teacher, and school initiatives, if applicable. Describe access to data sets required for your research. You should include letters of agreement in Appendix E. Finally, you should describe the capacity to disseminate information about your research, including the findings, and this includes a dissemination plan in Appendix A, and it should include sufficient time for key personnel to participate in the dissemination activities, including leadership events that will be organized by the network lead. Now we will turn to the requirements for a network lead proposal. The network lead is responsible for making sure the network runs smoothly and accomplishes its goals and objectives through these major sets of activities. The network lead is responsible for network administration and coordination. This includes planning and facilitating network meetings, we'll cover that shortly, and overall coordination among research teams. The network lead must coordinate cross-team training activities for early career researchers. This includes organizing opportunities across different research teams to train students, postdoctoral fellows, and other early career researchers who are working on network research. This could take different forms, such as webinars, opportunities to work on different research teams, summer workshops, or cross-team mentoring. Finally, the network lead must communicate network findings. This includes developing and hosting a network website for disseminating information, such as the goals and objectives of the research, describing the project, and making research papers and products available. The lead is also expected to organize briefings and presentations to stakeholders, such as policymakers and practitioners, and to organize the synthesis or overall summary of research findings across the network. Finally, although not a required responsibility, the network lead is encouraged to work with the Institute's regional education laboratories to provide practitioners and policymakers with opportunities to learn about the research findings and consider how they apply to their own contexts. The network lead is expected to possess subject area expertise in MTSS and should be committed to helping the network produce a body of work that will be informative and useful to policymakers, practitioners, and other researchers. There are five sections of the application narrative for network lead. Network administration and coordination, coordination of cross-team training activities for early career researchers, communication of network findings, personnel, and organizational resources. Note that the narrative is expected to be shorter for the network lead, recommended to be 15 pages compared to 30 for the research teams. 
Network lead proposals are required to describe a plan for network administration and coordination, including leadership activities. For a strong application, IES recommends that you discuss your vision of how the network lead will help the network accomplish its goals. Describe your plans for organizing network meetings. And please note, both the network lead and research team applications should note that the network is required to meet in person twice in the first year of the project and once annually in the remaining years. At least once in the first year and every additional year, the meeting must take place in Washington, D.C. for IES staff to attend. Recommendations include discussing major challenges the network may face, challenges within network and external challenges, and how the network lead will work with the research teams to overcome them. And discuss national leadership activities you expect to conduct and how you will work collaboratively with the research teams. For the early career activities, you are required to describe your plan for coordinating training activities for early career researchers in the network. The activities could take any number of forms, such as summer training institute, webinars, or cross-site mentoring. For a strong application, IES recommends that you explain how you will coordinate cross-team training for early career researchers working on various teams within the network. These include students, postdoctoral fellows, and other early career researchers. Discuss the role you envision for each research team in participating in the cross-team training. For example, this may include leading a workshop or finding research opportunities within their own research project. And discuss barriers to participation of early career researchers and how you will work collaboratively with research teams to overcome them. Network lead proposals are required to discuss a plan for communication and dissemination of network findings. For a competitive application, IES recommends that you discuss how you will work with research teams to communicate broadly about the network's objectives, findings, and activities. Describe your plans for taking the lead in writing the synthesis of the network's major findings. Discuss the expected timing of dissemination activities based on anticipated timing of the research activities. Discuss your ideas for using briefings and other forums for encouraging dialogue and feedback. Explain your vision for the network website how you will work with IES regional educational laboratories, and coordinate with national and state associations to share information. For the personnel section, the requirement is that you include a description of personnel qualifications. For a more competitive proposal, these are the recommendations. Discuss the PI's background in MTSS research, particularly with a focus on children with disabilities. Make sure to include the bio sketch in the appropriate section of the application. In addition, Discuss the PI's past experience working in a research network or similar collaboration. Past experience working with educators and policymakers, including disseminating research findings and providing technical support, and past experience coordinating activities related to the training or mentoring of early career researchers. Identify the key personnel who will be working to support the PI and include their bio sketches in the appropriate section of the proposal. Describe the management structure and procedures that you will use. Provide information on the percentage of time key personnel will devote to the project. As mentioned earlier, it's important to make sure that key personnel have enough time to commit to the project to get the work done. For this final section, the requirement is that you describe your organizational resources. For a competitive proposal, we recommend that you describe your institution's capacity and experience to function as network lead, including management of prior grants this size. Discuss the available physical and technological resources available at your institution to support network activities, such as meetings and training activities. Describe your plan to acquire any resources that are not currently accessible but are necessary for the project. Finally, discuss your editorial and communications capacity to produce and disseminate a comprehensive research summary or synthesis of the research findings, host a website, and distribute network products to target audiences. Section 3 covers application requirements. We'll start by what you're allowed to submit. A PI or project team may only submit one research team application, one network lead application, or both one research team and one network lead application, one of each type. This slide has important deadlines and dates associated with this network's competition. Try to upload your application several days before the deadline in this case, September 21st, 2017, at 4.30 p.m. The zero seconds here is a real deadline. This will allow you to avoid slowness of the server on the deadline date 
and allow time if a mistake is made and you need to upload it again. Letters of intent are requested but not required. If you don't submit one on time, email your program officer afterwards with your idea. Program officers review them and send you feedback, and the Standards and Review Office uses them to get an estimate of how many applications will be submitted and the topic areas, which helps them in planning and choosing peer reviewers. All the information in your letter of intent is superseded by your application, so there is no problem if you have changed your idea a little bit or even a lot during the time between your submission of your letter of intent and your full application. There are five appendices plus the budget and budget narrative that must be included. Note that Appendix B is not relevant to the network's competition this year because it includes responses to reviewers for revised and resubmitted proposals and this is the first year that this competition is being run. We'll go through each of the other appendices now. Appendix A, Dissemination Plan, is required. For the network lead, dissemination plans should include how you will incorporate information from research teams as well as the plan to coordinate the overall dissemination effort. For research teams, the plan should include how you will contribute to the network's overall dissemination efforts as well as your own dissemination efforts. For all applications, you should identify the expected audiences and ways to reach them. Include the expectation that you will publish in both peer-reviewed scientific journals as well as venues for policymakers and practitioners. If products result from the project, they should also be made available. Overall, your plan should reflect the actual goals of your research. For example, if you are developing a model or evaluating a model, it should reflect this purpose. Appendix C is optional. It includes figures, charts, and tables. For example, it may include your timeline or diagram of your management structure. It would also include measures used to collect data for your project, for example, individual test items, surveys, or observation or interview protocols. Appendix D is also optional. This is where you would include examples of the materials used as part of the intervention or assessment. For example, this may include curriculum material, computer screenshots, training documents, assessment items, or any other type of materials used in the intervention or assessment being studied. Please note the difference between assessments you should include in Appendix C and Appendix D. Appendix C contains measures you are using in your research to collect data. Appendix D contains the measures or materials that you are going to study, for example, what you are going to develop or validate. Although it's optional, Appendix E, Letters of Agreement, is strongly encouraged, particularly since MTSS research must be conducted within schools at the systems level. Reviewers will note if there is not already support from your sources of data. You should include letters of agreement from all your research partners. These can include schools or districts where research will be conducted, other data sources, for example agencies holding administrative data, or consultants for your project. Letters should clearly state the organization's expected role in the partnership and their commitments to the project. It should include the nature and extent of their commitment. Letters from holders of data should make clear that the data described in the application will be provided for the project's proposed use. Letters should be readable. Do not reduce the size or include poor photocopies. Appendix F is required for certain proposals. Applications for the research team must include a data management plan if you are evaluating a developed intervention or model, basically either an efficacy study or an effectiveness study. This appendix must describe your plans for making the final research data from the proposed projects accessible to others. It should include things like the type of data to be shared, plans for managing the data, final format of the data and expected documentation, and how others will be able to access the data. Data management plans are expected to differ depending on the nature of the project and data collected. Note that the costs of the data management plan can be covered by the grant and should be included in the budget and explained in the budget narrative. The peer review process will not include the plan in the scoring of the scientific merit of the application, but if your proposal is being considered for funding and your plan is determined incomplete, you will have to complete your plan before an award is made. As you prepare your budget forms and budget narratives, please take note of the maximum grant awards and project durations. For research teams, the maximum award amount is $4 million and the maximum duration is five years. For network lead applications, the maximum award is $1.5 million and the maximum duration is five years. 
applications may not exceed these maximums in order to be deemed responsible to the RFA. If they do exceed maximums, they will not be reviewed. You will complete a budget form, which will be accompanied by a budget narrative to explain the budget. Finally, let's discuss the basic steps to preparing a responsive, high-quality application. Your initial goal is to make sure the proposal gets into the hands of reviewers. That means download and complete the correct application package from Grants.gov. Pay close attention to the general and role-specific requirements in the request for applications. Do not exceed the maximum award amounts or durations. Comply with allowable content and required content and submit your applications no later than 4.30 p.m. Washington, D.C. time on or preferably before the deadline of September 21, 2017. Once IES receives your application, the IES Standards and Review Office takes it from there. This office is responsible for compliance screening for content requirements, like the appendices, responsiveness screening for program requirements, these are requirements we went over earlier for the research teams and the network lead applications. Remember, requirements are the minimal required for an application. That's what's used in responsiveness screening. Recommendations are used by peer reviewers to check the quality of the application. So after the application is deemed responsive to the RFA, the Standards and Review Office assigns the application to reviewers with substantive and methodological expertise on your topic. These primary reviewers will assign preliminary scores. The most competitive applications go to full panel. Keep in mind as you prepare your application that many panelists will be generalists on your topic area. What do we mean by that? In addition to reviewers who are experts on your specific topic, it is very likely that the review panels will represent a mix of disciplines and methodological expertise. Keep in mind this audience as you prepare your application. At the panel meeting, the panelists will discuss each application and each panelist will record their final scores. Funding decisions are based on panel scores and available resources, meaning our IES funds. Note that the criteria on which proposals will be evaluated corresponds to the requirements for proposals described earlier. For research teams, this includes the same four criteria, significance, research plan, personnel, and resources. Pay close attention to the recommendations for strong application. These recommendations are based on IES experience and reviewers use these recommendations to differentiate high and low quality applications. For the network lead role, the five criteria are the same as the requirements. Network administration, coordinating training activities for early career researchers, plans for communication and dissemination, personnel, and organizational resources. Once again, pay close attention to recommendations for a strong application. As the webinar comes to an end, I will leave you with a few extra tips to improve your application. First, put yourself in the reviewer's shoes. Good, clear writing makes a difference. It'll help get your ideas across accurately, and the reviewers appreciate an application that is easy to read. Use diagrams and figures to help explain complex ideas, such as conceptual frameworks. But do not use diagrams with tiny print. Next, make information easy for the reviewers to find. For example, follow the same headings and subheadings that are used in the RFA and use different types of formatting, for example, bullet points or boldface, to underscore your key points. Finally, seek input from other people before you submit your proposal. You can discuss the project with the IES program officer. At a minimum, you should definitely make sure your project idea fits the RFA before you embark on writing a full-blown proposal. This is often accomplished through the letter of intent and the program officer's response to it, but you can continue to ask the program officer questions as you write your proposal. You should ask colleagues, those who did not work with you on the proposal, to review the proposal. Finally, find someone to proofread the proposal before it is submitted. Typos and other errors are distracting to reviewers and they counteract the first point about good, clear writing. Finally, here are some references for you. The request for applications is on the IES funding website. You will need to read this. You can search abstracts of funded projects to get an idea of the types of projects we fund. However, keep in mind that this particular competition is new. You may want to look at the NCER network projects, though they differ in content and specific features from this competition. You must access the application package using grants.gov. Finally, here is my email address if you need to contact me. 
That's all we have for this webinar. Thanks for listening.